Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel having a good time. Uh, I have a good time every day if you really want to know about it. Uh, today's Tuesday, and we're here in Hawaii, the state of health, with the State Department of Health talking about pedestrian and bike safety uh, with Kari Bennis, who is a DOH trauma system public health educator, and Malia Harunaga, who is a project manager of the adult bike head and senior cycling uh, uh, department. <laughs> of the Hawaii Bicycling League, HBL. All right. Say hello, you guys. Hi. Hello. Hi out there. Oh, good. I can hear you now. All right. <laughs> so much better. OK, so let's, let's first let's talk about what you do, just in general. We'll drill down later. So uh, Kari, what do you do as the um, Department of Health Trauma System Public Health Educator? Well, my main focus is actually traffic safety. So this is why we're, we're here today. Um, a lot of the information that we look through in our office has to do with the trauma in, in throughout the state. And we look at the leading causes of trauma. And motor vehicles, um, whether it's motor vehicle crashes, bicycle-related crashes, or pedestrian, motorcycle, those all play an effect. And we all know that there are prevention efforts that we can definitely work on. So we would like to focus on doing things upstream so that fewer people will die and end up in our truck. Trauma yeah. system. So you like to train them before they get out on the road, before they have a trauma. Hopefully, yeah. that's ideal. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we can talk about how that works. Okay, and, and uh, Malia, what, what exactly do you do for HBL? Um, so I'm the adult education and senior cycling manager. Um, we have grants, and I basically manage the grants one for the adults, um, teaching them education, cycling education, also covering. Um, we do presentations for not just cyclists, but for drivers as well. Um, and then we Sometimes have... Sometimes I think they needed more. Yeah, you know, it, it does take two to tango, and it's both responsibilities, you know, one of the, the drivers and for the cyclists, you know, we all have to share the roads safely, so we have to, you know, educate folks. A lot of times they just don't know, you know, what the laws are and how to be safe. But, um, so that's one part of my uh, job title. And the other part, we have now a senior cycling program with the Hawaii Bicycling League that um, we provide recumbent tricycles to seniors for free. And we take them out every Tuesday, Thursday. So I was actually out there this morning, and we had a blast um, riding those recumbent tricycles. I mean, so. I mean this is a regular program. Not, this, this is isn't a regular training program. necessarily. No, nope. every Tuesday, down Thursday the road morning. in a tricycle. Yep. So we um, <laughs> take them out to the Neil Blaisdell Park um, right now, and then we ride on the Pearl Harbor bike path. So away from cars, you don't have to worry about you know worrying about traffic. They and must have a wonderful time. It's lovely. It's absolutely wonderful, and they're just so comfortable. Those those trikes. So any, anybody could really ride them. So that's what makes it great. Uh, are you a lawyer? Because I thought everybody in HBL was a lawyer. Mm, not, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Exception, OK. No. <laughs> All right. Well, I, you know, I want to talk more about that. But first, I want to define the problem we're dealing with, OK? It's, it's actually the dark side. Terrible things happen in trauma on, uh, without even getting to motorcycles, which are really dangerous vehicles bicycles, even bicycles, which shouldn't be dangerous at all. And yet, there are things that happen. If you fall without a helmet, you could really knock yourself out. Uh, I mean, it's, it's even worse than dying in the sense you could make yourself a vegetable. Um, so uh, what are we dealing with in Hawaii? Are a lot of people hurt this way? Um, when you look at the hole in the traffic area, uh, pedestrian-related uh, incidences, whether it be casualty or not, are relatively high and compared to other s states. And unfortunately, we win within the top three throughout the last several years of being some of the, you know, one of the worst states as far as um, the Worst numbers. states? Yes, but as far in as. In terms of trauma? Uh, as far as fatalities. And then the trauma is just a, a larger piece of the pie in comparison to the fatalities. I say, uh, the, the fatality is the, uh, the ultimate trauma. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, in regards to pedestrians, you can think of almost every two weeks somebody in Hawaii uh, specifically actually is killed in a pedestrian-related crash. And that includes bicycles? No, uh, bicyclists, fortunately, there's fewer fatalities, but we still have close to 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 a year that end up being uh, seeking medical treatment. So a lot of people do either fall off the bike or there are um, a smaller portion, but some of them are hit by a car. So, yeah. so definitely. Um, and even related to effect. John Kerry, by the way? 
no. My first what name. happened to him anyway? <laughs> you could have you could have helped him if only he'd been in Europe. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You could have advised him. You give him a little advice. You know, we'd be better off in in the diplomatic relations area today. Yeah. You know? Well, it's it's nice to see that we have some um, decision makers on bicycles, though. <laughs> Let's keep right. them on bicycles, <laughs> not have them fall but, off. Though. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. He could use a little yeah. training. Maybe he's getting some training now. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's it's dangerous. So what what are the common kinds of falls and common kinds of accidents that lead to you know trauma and injury? Well, when it comes to the more extreme sides, uh, inattention. I know when we talk about distractions, that is that plays a factor on both sides, but more so with the drivers causing an incident with you know a pedestrian or a bicyclist. That could be the texting, that could be, you know, the it's kids. Against the law. It is, yep, it is, you're right, you're right. But people are getting away with it. And sometimes inattention also falls into the other categories of either they just are not focused on the road, maybe there's somebody um, grabbing or trying to earn their attention in the car, could be people in the back seat. Um, other things like uh, they're looking, actually, they're paying more attention to the other road users being being the cars rather mm -hmm. than the pedestrians or the bicyclists well, that could be heavier. on the side. Yeah, because they're larger, they're more noticeable, they have this big mass versus the pedestrians and cyclists are on the side and they tend to go um, in the fringe or on the fringe of the road. What about the kind of con traffic uh, configuration? For example, um, if you're riding uh, the right-hand side of the road on your, on your bicycle and some driver who's not completely inattentive wants to make a right turn, go down a side street, it doesn't actually see you there because it's a blind spot or because the driver is just not attentive. Sure. Uh, that's a bad accident because it he's be. going to hit you, knock you over, maybe run, run over you even uh, because he or she didn't, didn't see you there and you didn't realize that he or she was going to make that turn because maybe there was no signal. You know? Right. So, and maybe this driver had a tinted window shield window which to me is worthy of discussion here today about tinted windows mm. it is <laughs> <laughs> well it is um, something of that nature if, if it does prohibit the individual that's walking or bicyclist or bicyclist making eye contact with that driver which is actually important because it gives us that social cue of oh it's okay to go or it's not and I know uh, uh, I've stopped at intersections before just because I cannot see even the driver themselves and I'm like I know it's you being ride, operated you ride, you ride bike. <laughs> I do ride a bike and I walk and I mean everybody is a pedestrian at some point in time so yes <laughs> Anytime this you is step a public up. space issue that's yeah. right that's right <clears throat> well I think it's very interesting about um, about tinted windows if I can go back to that <laughs> you know I remember there was a big political debate about this in the um, 70s or the early 80s mm -hmm. And um, the, the cyclists didn't want, uh, you know, didn't want tinted windows. They wouldn't, didn't want it permitted. They were, if permitted, they wanted to be very transparent, not dark. But some guys, you know, they got to be macho, you know, have the dark, you know, sedan type. And with the tinted windows, the problem with the tinted windows is you can't see the driver looking at you. Right. right. You don't know if he acknowledges you, recognizes there's a, a cyclist out there. Right. If you can see he's looking at you, the chances of him not seeing you are really minimal. Right. If he's looking somewhere else, then you've got to be specially careful. That's why tinted windows are so important or are so bad, right. as the case may be. That's my input on that point. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> now, when you teach people, including these elderly people on the tricycles, mm -hmm. uh, what, do you, what do you say to them to, uh, first of all, first of all, what do you say to them to allay their concerns? Because they're all going to be scared. They're all going to be worried get, about getting busted up, and they think they're old because it's a state of mind. They think <laughs> that if they get into an accident, they're going to break every bone in their body, which may to some extent be true. <laughs> what do you say to them? So we do have um, a whole range of cycling workshops, everything from you know teaching adults how to learn to ride a bicycle for the first time or if they haven't been on the bike for maybe a few years or a few decades even. Um, and then we have one that specifically targets those folks that um, want to ride with cars and with traffic, but you know they're afraid to do so. Um, so that's called our, our Cycling Skills 101 workshop, and that basically just goes over 
lane positioning, it goes over rules of the road, safety and visibility, all the stuff that you need to, you know, have the knowledge to be safe. Um, and it gives them the confidence to actually apply what they know and you know, feel hopefully more comfortable riding in the road as opposed to you know, riding on a sidewalk. And so in that situation that you, you just talked about, that right hook, it's called a right hook when um, a car is driving and then they turn into a, a person riding a bike, maybe because either yeah, in a blind spot or usually a lot of times it's uh, the driver under, underestimates the speed of the person traveling on a bike. So that's another thing. And we teach them, you know, these are the common crashes. So the right hook is the most common one. Um, there's also the left cross. There's a parking exit. Um, what's the left cross? It's very similar to the right hook, um, but the it sounds cars like a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> the, the driver in the car is turning left into like you know a side street or whatnot, and the, the person riding the bike either maybe was following too close behind a car and they didn't see it, or a lot of the times, like I said, um, they the car driver can't gauge how fast the person. So it's the same riding. thing on the other very side. Very similar, of the car yeah, yeah. But the right hook is a lot more common. Um, but all of these things, I mean, we teach them. So these are the common crashes, and then you know we give them a remedy to avoid these things, and it's basically just riding and taking control of the lane before you go through an intersection. So that mean, taking the lane means that you are actually riding in the center of a lane of traffic, and this is legal as far as Hawaii state law goes. It's legal for you to do so on your bike, and a lot of folks what's don't. That, what's that? What's that slogan? The old Hawaiian slogan about you have the right of the, the right of way in the road the people oh, own the Bob's road splintered paddle oh the one you're talking about no, no, no. It's, uh, everyone has safe the every king the safe king passage yeah the king, yeah, the <laughs> king. I, I forget it's it's an important slogan it was the law of the land okay um before before uh, hawaii be, uh, became a territory and right, that is that everybody that has a right you know oh to, to be road. safe on hawaii's roads is yeah, that the yes, one? yes okay yes, yes. everybody yeah. way back yeah. when one of the Maybe yeah, and that like still that. holds true, I mean, yeah. for sure, for this day. I mean, we all, if you're using the road, you have the rights to be safe to it. So it's like when folks are like, oh, you cyclists, you know, you don't pay the, like, law for the, you don't pay the road taxes or whatnot. But, you know, a lot of people who ride bicycles, me included, we have cars as well, so we will pay the same taxes. And the thing is, you know, those taxes aren't just from car funds, it's also from other things. So. Um, poverty taxes and whatnot. So that, you know, if you're elderly, if you don't own a car, does that mean you don't have the right to be safe as well? If you're a child who doesn't have a license, does that mean you, you know, aren't entitled to your own safety on the road? So, no, really everybody has the right to be safe on these roads. So. Yeah. Let me go back to another point about your right hook and left hook. Mm -hmm. Right. What is it? Right hook and left cross. Left cross. No. To me, cyclist has the last clear chance because the cyclist in his mind in his psychology he has to assume every car mm. is a dangerous weapon and every driver is inattentive um, and he has to make all his choices based on that he can never assume that a driver will be respectful or cautious or you know or, or do the right thing in a given traffic crunch so what so what does he do for a right hook? And I'll tell you what I would do, what I used to do when I, I, I was a bike racer. That's why I know about these things. You know. I know it's hard to believe, but it, I was a bike racer for several years. All right. And awesome. <clears throat> he has to fall back mm. uh, in the possibility that somebody's going to do a right turn in front of him or a left hook. He has to assume that that driver is going to do something crazy mm. or something unpredicted. So he has to, he has to know to, to fall back and not certainly not to be in a blind spot, certainly not to be riding parallel to a guy who's about, who, who mm -hmm. could be about to make the turn. Definitely. So, I mean, all those things, and it's a matter of trying to read the mind of the individual driver, mm -hmm. which I think you can do. It's a question of psychology through kinetics. In other words, you see how that car moves. You may not even be able to see the face of the mm -hmm. driver. You have no idea who that driver is. But you see the way the car moves, and you sort of make a profile in your head about whether that driver is predictable or unpredictable, whether that driver's good or not so good. Mm -hmm. and, and then you crank that, you factor that in like a little computer in your brain uh, in order to judge your own moves. And in that way, knock wood, knock wood, um, you don't get clipped.
Mm -hmm. you know, that's just to add to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, you have to communicate in your own way too as well, you know, not by pushing yourself all the way to the right side, you know, how a lot of people ride next to the curb, right next to the curb. Dangerous. Um, it's not the best place to be. Oftentimes there's lots of debris that gets swept over there, but also, you know, you're putting yourself all the way out there and cars, it, if they can't see you, you're typically out of their mind. Like they don't even think that you're there. So it's also good in that way to take the lean because that way you're communicating with others that, all right, I'm here, everybody can see me, you know, let's not be, you know, too risky about things here. So you're, put, you're making it easier on the drivers. Yeah. The other thing is if you ride in the gutter and something does happen, you mm -hmm. have no options. Yep. Right. There's nowhere you can go. Yep. And you know, either you can stop, which this may not help, uh, or you're going to get splatted all over the sidewalk, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so to me, it's really dangerous to ride in the gutter, mm -hmm. aside from being unseemly on your clothing. <laughs> <laughs> can we see those pictures one more time? You had some stats up there. I want to just explore the Ah, there we go. Look at that. This is you know about it's kind this, of right? shocking. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah. Um one of the things that sometimes surprises people is, I guess those that walk around tend to be a little bit intoxicated, or are those that actually are, end up in a fatal incident, that they wind up testing positive for drugs or alcohol. But um, aside from that, because that's a bigger problem to tackle, is the um, substance use or misuse. But the improper crossing or walking or standing in the road tend to be common things. That could be whether it's jaywalking, or it could be somebody that's, you know, they're going around the vehicle on the wrong side. Mm. They're just, they're in the wrong part of the roadway itself. Um, but that's, that's definitely true. I know that there's a couple other slides out there, but um, some people ask, like, when, when do most crashes occur? Actually, um, for pedestrians, the ones that end up to be fatal end up, most of them are at night or the, the, the hours where it's poorly lit. Oh, we have to talk about that, yeah. So wh whether it be the wee hours of the morning of dawn um, to dusk, and then um, it's mainly those hours in between. Whether it's on a lit street or not, a lot of times, you know, people are not inclined to always put that nice bright vest on when they go out walking. So we have to understand that, yes, we're not always visible, especially those darker hours. And so that's something to think about. Okay, we, we're starting to understand the problem now. Yeah. Um, that being said, we can take a break so we can sort of integrate other information. And when okay. we come back, we're going to talk about exactly how you maximize your safety, not only individually, but in numbers. Ooh. Um, okay, those guys are Malia Harunaga and Carrie Bennis. Uh, Malia is a project manager of uh, the Adult Bike Ed and Senior Cycling <coughs> Department in the Hawaii Bicycling League. I call it department. It's probably 27 people in your department, right? Uh, and Kat, how many people are in your department? In our organization, we have five full-time staff, and I am the one program manager for that. So, <laughs> there you go, numbers. And Carrie Bennis, who's with the Department of Health Trauma System, public health educator, we'll take a short break. We're going to think about the dimensions of the problem, and then we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding that science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests who are scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo. And you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here, we're, you know, you missed the break, I'm sorry. You know, if we could only let you see the breaks, you'd learn so much more. <laughs> anyway, so, first thing, the question of this, of this part of the show is, you know, how can we make it safe? 
and you guys are obviously collaborating, working together, which I really like to see that. Uh, it's, it's the government and the nonprofits with, a, with the same mission uh, coming at it from different points of view. So let me, let me ask a sort of general question. I'm going to start with you, uh, Carrie. Um, how do you make it safe? What do you do to make it safe for cyclists? For cy cyclists specifically? Or we want to talk about pedestrians too? We can include them. I'll let it, I'll, you can okay. answer it any uh, way can, you want. Okay. <laughs> so uh, something that's kind of neat that our office does is we actually, from our emergency medical services data, we collect all the crash locations. And we actually have stored Crash that. Location. Yes, we have stored that information online, and it's on a publicly accessible file. Um, anybody can receive that information. They can actually look at it from separate modes, whether it's just the bicyclist. If you want to know about bicyclists on King Street, you can pull up, you know, 2014 and uh, back to 2007 to see how many people were hit along that corridor, corridor on a bicycle, or you could flip it to a motorcycle or moped. And the idea behind that is to inform our decision makers. Um, you know, we want to be able to, you know, share this information with planners and engineers and the people with the, you know, I would say the influence of the money the <laughs> and the wherewithal. They can see that, that there are certain areas want that have... to go and, and re redesign, rebuild that area? It could be, um, it doesn't always have to be extreme redesign, but it could be things as simple as a road diet, which um, both Hawaii Bicycling League and many others talk about and it's understanding the amount of traffic that's on a roadway and it, whether we can you know take away a lane of traffic and make that more suitable for pedestrians or bicyclists and just increase the amount of modalities that are able to safely use that roadway. A road diet? diet. That's right, diet. slimming things down. You know I've heard a lot of different kinds of diets. It's healthy. There's, there's been no one. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Now, my, my first question, I have a lot of questions about what you said. My first question, sorry. That's my okay. first My first question is, do they listen? Some do and some... What do you do if they don't listen? Well, we just keep sharing the information and we, you know, we give it to the other individuals with other voices. And sometimes, you know, we get places and sometimes it, it you know, yeah, the, some people will look at that and they'll try to find the excuses of why incidents are occurring in that area. But um, the nice thing is over the years since sharing this information, we can point to areas where we know um, that have been out in you know, with the public eye and we've been able to back that up with data and changes have occurred. Did you, what, what kinds of changes? I mean, what, what kinds of suggestions would you make to say the city department of planning and permitting, for example, uh, you know, in order to improve safety in a given intersection? What would you say to them? Well, I mean, besides uh, yeah. telling them this is dangerous yeah. as it is. Yeah, looking at the numbers, um, it's good to look at, you know, go down. I, I totally agree with walk and bike audits. Is go down and look and observe the traffic and the patterns of the individuals themselves. Um, you know, there's a lot of information that, and that's a best practice that you know you can gather what the individuals' behaviors are like, especially the cars. A good example of something that just recently happened is a left um, turn signal on Kapilani Boulevard by Kamuku. And that was. That's a very crowded area. Yes, it's a very. I mean, you have individuals shifting from the mall to Walmart or wherever. Everybody is all cup of kahi over yeah. all the traffic and, and the noise. And there, there was a high number of pedestrian incidences in that area. I know they did a news story on it. And um, uh, it's amazing. The, the, actually, that protected left-hand signal now holds the pedestrians and the individuals walking from proceeding so that you can get cars through, but you can also, you know, they're going to have their walk signal, and it's going to be actually a better You probably spot. like good traffic signals. I absolutely do. I'm a fan of those. I am, too. <laughs> I would, and, I, and I would say that Malia is probably a fan, fan too. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the other question I have is, this, was this, how hard is it for me to get this information? If I say I'm going to make, I'm going to structure a commute ride, okay, from point A to point B. That's yeah. why I'm going to go to work. I'm going to take the plunge and you know ride to work, for example. Um, can I get a kind of map of the danger points so I know where I have to be specially careful? Absolutely, and we actually house that uh, map on the Department of Health website under the Injury uh, Prevention Branch. But we also we made a short link. 
for individuals that are like, oh, wait, where is that map? But it, if you've heard of bit.ly, it's bit.ly forward slash crash map. It's right great. there. Great. Yeah, okay, it's so you pretty get you easy. right there. No, no long link or anything. Yep, no long link or, link or anything. And actually, individuals can bring up that map. And we've designed it in a way that you know people can download that information if so they want. So what would it say to me? If I go to Kamoku and Kapiolani, that's a, that's a rating of 197 or something. It'll actually show the incidents there. It'll have oh, like wow. a cluster. And if they're, um, sometimes it's pleasantly surprising when you see certain areas where you're like, this street or my block actually has very few. And you can actually, you know, bring up all the years past, up to 2007 to see how many incidents are there. And you can zoom down as close as you want to your neighborhood or that route that you want to go on and you can plug in everything that is along the way including there's a measurement tool to see how far you went <laughs> so okay well let me right. take it a step further and see what you guys ooh, oh is that it that's it wow, oh that's, that's a lot of cool. accidents that is that's that really does cool. include motor vehicle as well so um, when you zoom into a, a smaller section it's not as uh, it's kind there's of nothing bloody. Going on in Kaina, <laughs> there's nothing going on in Kaina Point. That's, yeah. that's where the road <laughs> stops. <laughs> no roads, no accidents. Yes. Uh, and lots is happening in Waikiki in the Central oh, Business nice. District. Yes, and we do know that about 76% of our incidents occur in the urban core. So. Okay, now why not? You may have good reasons why not. I'll ask you both this question. Why not make a GIS, um, GPS, a GPS program for my, my cell phone, which will tell me how red, let's call it red as danger, it's a danger, indicator of danger, how red an intersection is. And I can put the cell phone in, in a bracket on my handlebars, and as I am passing through, the GPS is going to, you know, take a snapshot on your map and tell me that that one's really red. Watch out. What do you think? Well, we're almost there. Um, yeah. You, I, I actually did download this uh, map on to my cell phone. So at any point in time, whether I'm at a meeting and I want to say, oh, you know, actually this intersection is pretty dangerous, or um, it's not. You could, actually, it's really easy to pull it up on your phone. It's not kind of a good uh, thing to have when you want to create some well, conversation. You, know, you don't want to compromise. <laughs> To compromise attenti attentivity. Right, right. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, if you had it on a bracket and you could see the thing turning red as you're going to an intersection, you might want to avoid it. You might want to really take special, yeah. you know. Uh, and because it, it leads to another question, and maybe, I don't know, HBO might be interested in this. So suppose uh, I had a, re a, a rating for intensity, mm -hmm. and say the highest intensity would be, I'm making this up, 200. Okay, so anything approaching 200 would be dangerous. Okay, and then you had little signs, little signs at the intersection, and it said 200, 195, 150, whatever it is. Okay, and that way I, as I approach, and a driver too now, I would know there have been a lot of accidents at this intersection, so how about being really careful? You think that would be of value? You think it would, be, it would have cost benefit because it's not cheap to put a sign up? Yeah. Uh, well, I would hope that uh, information like that would be passed on to those decision makers so they can change, change that spot ahead of time. So when they know that something like that is, okay. you know, that, that, answer, means, yeah. that means that maybe we should dedicate some time into restructuring or redesigning the way that intersection is. I mean, I personally would rather it yeah. not have to worry about avoiding things just because they're it's all dangerous. About, it's yeah. all about dedication. Right yeah. now, we're going to dedicate some time to a break. Okay. Sounds good. When we come back, I'm going to be asking about HBL. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Aloha. My name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the island. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. 
I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state. Or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. Okay, we're back, we're live. We, we, we took a little dedicated time for a break. <laughs> now we're here again in Hawaii, the state of health, talking about pedestrian and bike safety. I guess it's all lumped up. And uh, we have Carrie Bennis, she's the Department of Health Trauma System Public Health Educator, and Malia Haranaga, Project Manager of Adult Bike Education and Senior Cycling in the Hawaii Bicycling League, one of my favorite organizations of all time. I was there when it was started. Oh, you, you 40 were, years ago. You were not yet. Born. I was not even thought about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so going to HPL. <clears throat> what does HPL do in this regard? If I, if, you know, if I know that Kapiolani and Kamogu, you know, is a lot of action and a lot of people who are looking at too many things at the same time and who are just interested in getting across there or out of there, uh, how, how do I warn the cyclist? How do I warn the motorist? Mm, okay, so um, places that have had, you know, a cyclist fatality or a pedestrian um, fatality, we will hold um, memorial rides and walks. If the family is all right with it, um, it's to honor the person that has lost their life, um, you know, and celebrate their life, but also to um, bring awareness that, you know, this tragedy occurred and they are all preventable. So. Um, we hold solutions meetings after them um, in the area that the tragedy occurred, usually with the help of either the neighborhood board or the family or, you know, the governmental folks that want to push for safer streets. And we'll hold that solutions meeting to talk about what can be done to prevent these tragedies from occurring. So in places that, you know, so there was a recent one um, in Nuwanu. They, they held a solutions meeting and they talked about that road diet that Carrie was talking about and you know what we can do I mean it might take away parking but you know is parking really worth people's lives so you know it just kind of makes people think about you know what the priorities are so um, something like that will take a look at the streets do the road diet and kind of figure out what's best for people for you know not only pedestrians and cyclists but for the motorists as well just so everyone can be safe um, but as far as safety, we also... On that point, though, <laughs> I really think there's, there's a huge possibility in there. <clears throat> you know the FAA. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's the FAA and also the Department of Transportation in general. When there's a train crash, mm -hmm. you know, or derail, derailing, when there's a plane crash, when there's a bad highway pileup, you know, they investigate. Mm -hmm. They send out a, you know, an investigator. He, he's not fooling around. And he goes and he writes a report, he takes photographs, he examines everything and anything, he has all kinds of authority to get facts. And he comes back, <clears throat> he, find, he makes findings of facts, he makes uh, what we call um, conclusions, <coughs> opinions, uh, recommendations. And, and then the, the federal agency involved will actually take action in order to prevent that. In the past, every flight, every flight uh, accident, has an investigation like that. <clears throat> to never take it lightly in any way. And, and that way you get better safety in, in federal transportation mm -hmm. anyway. But w you, you guys could actually collaborate. You could go beyond, a, what did you call it, a meeting? A solutions meeting. Solutions meeting. You could actually write a report, findings of fact, conclusions, opinions, recommendations, formal. In fact, you could write it together. Uh, and, you know, and then now it has a little government weight to it. And then you say, and you send it to the right people, or maybe the people who don't want to see it, you send it to them too. Right. They say, this, our recommendation was that you change the signals here, that you move the curve there, that you put signage uh, to tell them to slow down, mm -hmm. that you repay, whatever, I, you know, with any kind of physical structure or traffic flow issue. And you make a formal report as if you really knew, and you do really know because after you do a lot of these, these mm -hmm. solutions meetings, you really pretty much know the pattern. 
and what can be done to fix it. If you made a formal report, you'd be acting just like the FAA, and people would take you seriously. That's what I think, especially in a fatality case. Mm -hmm. I interrupted you, though. <laughs> Comments on that? I think that um, this may not be that level, but it definitely is a step in the right direction. Uh, the incident that she talked about in Nuwanu, uh, we definitely saw some of the key decision makers come to the table along with the community and they were able to see the community themselves express their desire for a safer change. And that was, that was a very positive moment, I think, to see the two sides saying, yes, we understand that there, is a, there was not only a key incident here, but they looked at stuff like the crash map and they saw that that corridor can really benefit from some changes and especially for a community that you know that that actually that's a community that does walk a lot so mm -hmm. it would benefit from those kind of ty types of things. Okay Malia you had more I interrupted yeah. your flow but go ahead. Um, as far as safety we are I mentioned earlier that we are not only trying to educate you know people riding bikes to do so safely but we're also trying to edu educate the drivers as well so we have a presentation that is available for any kind of businesses, organizations, companies, groups, anybody. Um, I think you have to have more than 15 people um, to for us to come and present to you for free, but it's called the Walk, Bike, Drive presentation, and it can be tailored to any um, you know uh, time limit that you have. But we'll come and talk and just talk about, you know, um, not only safety from a driver's point of view, but safety from um, you know, a cyclist's point of view. And so why would that you know, person riding a bike put themselves in the middle of the lane? You know, that's silly. But you know, hopefully we'll explain to them, because it's difficult. You know, if you've never ridden a bike before, you've only driven a car, it's hard to relate. It's hard to understand why someone would do what they're doing while they're riding a bike. But you know, when you explain to them, oh, you know, there's wind blasts that come off the car if, you, if you're passing me two feet away from me, I can feel that. Um, it just gives them a little bit, you know, time to reflect and like think about the actions of why we're actually doing this. It's for not only our safety or a person riding a bike safety, but for the person driving the car as well, because no one wants to hit a cyclist and you don't want to deal with that. So um, a thing that we like to emphasize is that, you know, it's not cyclists and motorists. Um, it's people, you know, driving cars and people riding bikes. So that dual mentality of cyclists and motorists, it really like, you know, creates this animosity that we, is unneeded. Unneeded. So, yeah, yeah, us and them. The it's, farmers and the ranchers can be friends. Indeed they can. <laughs> and they can be a great, you know, bond. And, and like I said, I'm a driver and I'm a cyclist as well. So I'm just the person. You know, we're all just people in the end. And I think that is a strong point and something that um, needs to be changed in folks' mind for them to actually move ahead and you know not just think oh those cyclists they all don't know how to ride like you know they're they're people too yeah. and regrettably a, a public opinion you know has to <laughs> be educated on this i had a <clears throat> jury trial one time we did um we did uh, voir dire the jury and uh, half the jury felt that cyclists should never be on the road wow. the other half felt wow. that cyclists should never be on the sidewalk we so settled, we settled the be? case <laughs> we settled the case because we didn't find we were representing the cyclist we settled the case because we didn't feel the jury was in any way simpatico with bike riders. Oh my and and that, that's a huge pro problem in uh, public education. But I wanted to go into one point, um, you know, that HBL does often uh, advocate for, and that is if you have a lot of cyclists on the road, mm -hmm. such as hopefully you will on King Street, um, if you have a lot of cyclists on the road, that itself makes it safer to cycle. Mm -hmm. you know? is, is it true? Mm -hmm. statistically and Same by the maps is. Is it, is, and, and what can we do to make that happen I mean if it happens I think it, Hawaii would become more of a nirvana as I said a, before we began you know if there's one thing that could have a profound change on the state is more people cycling you know because it, it, it goes in every direction I'm serious about that totally. yeah so what about it is it true yeah, so, I mean, obviously, if you're one person riding a bicycle, your your frame is very small. You take up a lot less room. Visual presence on the road is a lot smaller than, let's say, a car. Um, if you have two cyclists, then, obviously, your presence is doubled. And then you're a lot more visible. People notice you a lot better, especially if you're wearing, you know, high-vis reflective clothing or at least, you know, white. Um, that definitely draws attention. 
Um, so that's why things like the cycle track or the, the King Street protected bike lane um, is really doing, you know, moving forward with good bicycling infrastructure because it's actually concentrating the people riding bikes to one area so that more people can see them instead of kind of, you know, all across the, the roadway on King Street. Now they're all in one area and folks can see them better. So where's the next one? Um, they're thinking about two other places. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to disclose that, but <laughs> possibly, oh, South, <laughs> possibly <laughs> South Street um, or P.E. Coy, but I think they're leaning towards South Street. Yeah, yeah you got to both, both the east, west, yeah, and north, yeah. south. Yeah, so yeah. you need, in order for people to ride their bikes, obviously this two-mile stretch, you know, whether it falls along where your workplace is or your house resides, you know, people aren't going to go out of their way necessary to, to ride on that two-mile stretch. But if there is a minimum grid that connects all, all of Oahu, ideally, if it connects it, then people will want to ride because, you know, there's all these arterial streets that you can choose to ride, bike lanes all over. Um, that's really going to get people out. <coughs> so what's bikes. the relative cost of a bike lane on the one hand and a uh, elevated... Uh, rail system on, on the other. What's, what's oh the... Boy. What's <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, you get a lot know. more mo mileage with paint. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. It, indeed. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, that's, that's just the truth there. <laughs> paint is cheap. I mean, really, can you... Or I mean, this way, how many bike lanes could you build for the cost of rail? You could paint the entire island. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty you sure. really could. But... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, I want to give you guys an opportunity to talk to the motorists now, and talk to the, the cycle riders, and talk to the city council. Well, if, if, <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so you know, we're almost at the end of our throw. Um, so uh, let's take a minute or two, and each one of you, um, okay, uh, you start, Kari. Okay. Uh, give your message. Look at look at that camera over there. That camera one. one? Okay, that one, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if, I, if I were to give my message to first the driver, I'd say, first of all, you know, pay attention. Whatever it may be that's around you, the most important thing is to focus on the driving itself and those that are around you in your periphery. And don't be afraid to look over the shoulder to see if um, people are in, in those potential blind spots. But also, another thing that, you know, uh, we're coming into kind of the nice summer season, and people like to drink, but I understand that it, it's possible, you know, to put the drinks aside and let somebody else drive, um, to keep our sober drivers the ones that are driving, opposed to our inebriated ones. Those are the two things I would say for the drivers. For cyclists, it's just, like you said, be predictable, but also expect the unpredicted. Yeah. yeah. And the city council? City council? Um, you know where the problems are. Check that map out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's, let's do you, <laughs> why don't you look at camera that. two, camera two is over there, All right. okay, and tell them what, give, tell them, give them your thoughts on those three possibilities. All right, so for drivers, as Carrie mentioned, I think those are fantastic points, but um, also, you know, just slow down, take your time, we live on a small island, we don't have to be rushing all over the place, and, you know, plan your, your day out so you aren't rushed. Um, going to create a lot less stress off of you um, and that's going to make your day a lot better but in that way you're also you know you might save a life um, getting to your destination two minutes faster by speeding you know is not worth someone's life so don't speed um, and for uh, people riding bikes um, take one of our cycling workshops um, they're really helpful you can check out hbl.org slash workshops and we have a whole list there but as Carrie mentioned, I don't think I could have put it any better, but, um, you know, be predictable and just um, follow the rules of the road. They're, they're there for a reason, and to um, challenge that is, you know, challenging your, your own safety. So, um, and then the lawmakers just put more bike lanes, more bike lanes. <laughs> and that's, that's basically it. Do you agree with my, my initial statement? Um, it's a to little reachy. Us? That uh, you know, the, the one single thing that we can do to improve the quality of life in the state is <laughs> build bike lanes. I'm all for it. I'm there. totally. Why, for it. why do you feel that way? I mean, bicycling is great. Not only, of course, you know, everybody knows the benefits. It's good for the environment. Um, it's good for your health, 
saves you money. Um, it shows that co uh, the cost of a car, owning a car, is about $8,000 per year, as opposed to a bicycle is probably about 200. And those are mainland figures, so it doesn't take into consideration your know, higher gas prices. Um, biking is just a great way of transportation, and I, I hope to see it, you know, really take off. And we would love to have Hawaii, you know, a cyclist paradise, and that, that's my dream for sure. Not only you, but the State Department of Health. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's what I love about the State Department of Health. <laughs> We'd like to be healthy. Yeah. Yes, we'd like to right. be healthy, and you're looking out for everyone, and that's, that's why right. you're involved in this. It's great that you guys are collaborating. It's great you're doing what you're doing. I think you will have a result, and it won't be long. You'll see. It's a rolling stone. You'll see. Rolling <laughs> tire wheel. Rolling, like rolling <laughs> snowball, whatever. <laughs> okay, this is Hawaii, the state of health. Talking about pedestrian and bike safety uh, with Kari Bennis, the uh, Department of Health Trauma System Public Health Educator and uh, Malia Harunaga, Project Manager of Adult, Bike Ed, and Senior Cycling for the HBO. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Oh, this is, this is how we're getting the word out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hoping with